is that? Was it a done deal by the country man? It's actually the opportunity for proper engagement is actually after the table of the year. <laughs> Tell you the guy on the ride that was me. I remember taking uh, Carly down to Disney World. Remember, and Renee and the boys go pretty slowly. She's like, you know, tomorrow's our day. We're going on all the rides, and that was me. And I'm hoping that uh, the guy teaching the teenager how to drive. I'm hoping that's not me. So <laughs> I got about six, eight months to prepare for that. So so we'll see what happens. So good morning, everybody. Good morning. Um. A couple weeks ago, Gina had uh, asked me if I would stand in for her today with her being a creation. And I said, okay. And I came up and said, all right, you know, is there a sermon series that's happening or is there a particular scripture? And what she did is she pointed to this bulletin that we've seen the last few weeks. And I'm looking at this saying, all right, love, I, could, I might be able to pull that off. Peace, joy, patience, not on this earth, not me. <laughs> Kindness, maybe now. But she pointed to this, okay? She pointed to faith. And I was like a little kid that was asked to do the dishes or cut the grass. I was like, do I have to? <laughs> and she hesitated. And I looked and I said, you know what? I, I love Gina, but I got to remember, I, I serve God. And uh, he knows the way I work. And uh, he knows where I take my nudges from. So when, when Gina tells me to do something, typically I do. You see, faith is tough for me. Uh, I'm pretty analytically driven. You can't touch it. You can't feel it. You can't see it. And for me, you can't put it in a spreadsheet and analyze it. You know, for me, it's not a leap. You know, the, the uh, analogy I always used when I discussed this with Gina was getting into a pool. 
Now you'd see a lot of kids and a lot of people, they just go to the deep end and jump in the pool. Cannonball, what have you. Me, no, 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 no. I go in the steps, start with my ankles, work toward my knees, go to my waist, maybe my shoulders, and ultimately, I'm in the pool. See, the truth is, I'm still on my faith journey. I'm not yet at my faith destination. And I, I don't think that I will until hopefully I'm in heaven. And I use that word hope for a reason. You see, we often split things into two groups. There's yes and no, there's black and white. But the reality is there's always a lot of room in the middle. There's always a lot of gray area. And I, I have, to, have to confess, I think I'm in that gray area. And when it comes to the belief in God, we typically have believers and non-believers, right? I think there are a lot of, better? Hello? Not working. Can everyone hear me? Okay. I think there are a lot of hopers. I hope to meet Jesus someday. I hope to reunite with my parents. Or when I'm in heaven, I hope, I, I hope to someday see the Eagles hoist that Lombardi trophy. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so as I stand here today, I, I got to confess, I am, I am preaching and speaking probably more to myself than I am to all of you, and certainly hoping that uh, 15 minutes from now, I'm a little further into the pool. So when you look at this, where, where do you start, or where, where do I start when I'm looking at this particular topic? Well, it's with scripture. And I tell you, it's like that Snickers commercial, you know, not going anywhere for a while. There is so much scripture in the Bible about faith and um, about, about prayer. So I'm gonna start with a couple of very, very basic ones. One you saw in the, uh, in the video, Hebrews chapter 11, verse one. Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. <coughs> okay, even I can get that. Corinthians uh, chapter seven, ver excuse me, chapter five, verse seven. For we live by faith, not by sight. How about if we go a little further out? Thomas Aquinas, he once said, to one, who has no, to one who has faith, no explanation is necessary. To one without faith, no explanation is possible. Okay. Or Martin Luther, the founder of the Protestant church. This one I like, it's simple and it's clear. Pray and let God worry. Or how about we go a little further out? You know, John Wooden, arguably the greatest coach uh, in the history of American sports. He once said, there are many things that are essential to arriving at true peace of mind. And the one most important is faith, which cannot be acquired without prayer. There's that coupling of prayer again. And how about the greatest minds out there? Because if you think about it, sometimes your mind is your enemy. What did Benjamin Franklin have to say? The way to see by faith is to shut the eyes of reason. Benjamin Franklin. And arguably the smartest guy around is uh, Albert Einstein. What did he say? That deep emotional conviction of the presence of a superior reasoning power, which is revealed in the incomprehensible universe, forms my idea of God. Wow, I guess what he's saying is despite all the thinking, all, none of this could be possible, all told, all together, without a God. So what does that all mean? Well, you know what? Maybe your brain is not always your best friend. You know, they say you only use 10% of it. There could be a good reason for that. You know, the constant need for proof. The constant question of why. Seeing is believing, right? But you know what? How about this thing? We all have one of these, right? I'm pretty sure I've seen a lot of head shaking. You know, I, I deliver emails with this, I send texts to my friend, I get the weather here, I can see where there's a traffic jam, I can get scores. So why don't we question this? Think about it. Rich, you and I are on a desert island, 100 miles from each other, okay? How long before you text me? 
Gonna be a while. Yeah, we're trying to start a fire and chasing rabbits. So I came across this story when I was doing my research. And it's a day in school, six year olds, and a teacher's trying to speak of evolution, religion, and she's trying to make a point. She goes to Tommy. Tommy, go to the window. Do you see the tree outside? Tommy says, yes. Tommy, do you see the grass outside? Yes. Tommy, look up in this, up, up, look up. Do you see the sky? Yes. Teacher, do you see God? Tommy says, no. Teacher says, well, that's my point. Maybe God doesn't exist. Then a little six-year-old raised her hand and she said, can I ask Tommy a few questions? Okay. Tommy, do you see the tree outside? Yes. Tommy, do you see the grass outside? He's starting to lose his patience, but yes. Tommy, do you see the sky? Yes. Tommy, do you see the teacher? Yes, she's right there. Do you see her brain? No. And I guess according to what we learned today, she doesn't have one. <laughs> So this begs the question, where does the thinking that's driven by our heads end and the faith grounded in our hearts and souls, where does that begin? And how do we affect this scale? How do we slide this scale? Number one is we pray and we pray often. Keep the dialogue. And secondly, what we could do is we could pause. And again, I'm speaking to myself, I, we, get so caught up in the regrets of yesterday and the worries about tomorrow that we completely lose the God's gift of right now. I think I saw evidence the other day, you, know, you guys, most of you know little Maxi. I use my kids a lot when I come up here. He's in the pool, he's wearing his vest, he's floating around. Renee will remember this. And she's in the deep end also, and he's just kicking his feet, fighting his vest, moving toward her. And he just flat out has the giggles, the belly giggles. He is laughing and laughing and laughing. He's moving toward her. Before you know it, they're six inches apart. He's choking on water. She's laughing and making, making faces. And uh, for a moment there, I was actually in the moment. And that doesn't happen for me very often. So that's what we have to move toward. So what was that? That was a gift from God. Duh. So that is an example of pausing. And I learned more about this at a sales seminar uh, recently. I learned about self-talk, which is what's going on in your brain. And uh, I don't know if you guys realize, but most of us could speak about 100 words a minute. But I don't know if you know that you can actually think 400 words a minute. Think about that. So often instead of being present, we're too busy up here. You know, and sometimes those thoughts are just flat out wrong. Think about it. We, we think things. And because we think them, we take them as fact. They're going on in my brain. Really? I'm not good enough. I'm not worthy of love. I can't do this. I'm limited. Nobody likes me. I don't deserve this. It's in your brain. It's fact, right? No. You have to learn to challenge your thoughts. So we, I, we need to close our eyes so we can see more clearly. We need to go to a quiet place, turn off our brains so we can hear. So this is kind of like one of those uh, infomercials late at night, it just keeps on giving. So if you're not there yet, let's, let's consider this. What are the consequences of a life without faith? Here's a quote from Henry Ward Beecher. Uh, he was a leader in the movement to end slavery a clergyman, a speaker. And he said, every tomorrow has two handles. We can take hold of it with the handle of anxiety or the handle of faith. So clearly what he's saying is the opposite of faith is fear, worry, anxiety, loneliness. None of us want that. He doesn't want that for us. Again, more examples of this that I see in my own world. And once again, I'll use little Max. You see, uh, he's a special needs child. He's a, a couple years behind. So basically, I have two choices. A, I could dwell and worry. 
Will he be happy? Can he have a family of his own? Who will care for him when Renee and I are gone? So I'll pray, dear God, please give me the answers now so I don't have to worry. It's not how faith works. The other thing I could do is I could just simply enjoy and celebrate the wonder of this little gift from God and who he is and how he touches all people that cross his path. Same scenario, same circumstance, same fact. The only difference is that word faith. And then there's a little gate. See, I had this vision of he and I watching Eagles games together, you know, coaching him in Little League, you know, seeing him get a hit in the ninth inning, thanking me when he gets, uh, and gets into a Hall of Fame somewhere. <laughs> All right, maybe not quite that extreme. That's, that's, that's high expectations. But you know what? Little Gabe loves to dance. That's his thing. And you know, that's not good. It's actually great. You see, it's not my job to chart his course, to create his plan. God has that covered. So my job is to just love him, teach him, support him, and not worry about stuff. I'll leave my worries over here at the cross. Again, that word, faith. And as I said, I'll, I, mentioned, I mentioned before, I worry a little bit about Max, but I still have to have faith that God has a plan. And you know, maybe Carly, maybe Gabe have a role in that plan. If I, if I look and listen and pay attention, maybe I would see that. You see, Carly, it's interesting. We, uh, she's a very sensitive little girl. And when uh, Renee was pregnant, we had a little party for her because she knew, she didn't talk about it a lot, but she wanted siblings. So we were far enough along, we had a little party, we got a t-shirt that said, I'm the big sister of twins, and you know, made a big deal of it, got a cake. And uh, we gave her this, this gift, she started to read it, she was starting to not wonder what was happening, and getting a little nervous, and then we said, yes, mommy's gonna have twins. She immediately just broke out and cried. It was an incredible moment. You know, this is a teenager that should be really completely caught up in her own world and herself. But no, that's, that's not who she is. Recently, in writing a letter to, to uh, Renee at, uh, at your walk to Emmaus, she said, you know what? These two are the lifeblood of the family. So maybe part of God's plan is, is Carly being her, his big sister. Because the things that are installed in her could only be installed by God. Again, that word faith. And then there's Gabe, which surprises me. You know, he runs around the house there like any two brothers. But recently, Renee was at school. And a teacher came up to her and said, you know what, in, in 35 years of teaching here, I've never seen a sweeter boy than little Gabe. She's like, well, what do you mean? She says, every day when they get off the bus, uh, Gabe takes Max to his classroom, makes sure he's situated, has everything he needs before he goes to his class. And every day um, at lunch, he makes sure Max is all set, sitting where he needs to be. And she says, I will oftentimes see him across the cafeteria Doing that little heart sign, looking at Max, Max looks at him and smiles. Again, that word faith. Maybe I gotta worry less. Maybe he's got this covered. So as I said earlier about faith, you know, you, you really can't see it. Well, really? You can see what I just described, can you not? You can't touch it. Really? My parents both passed away, and I experienced them both here. A lot of people touched me. A lot of people gave me faith. I was able to touch it. I am able to feel it with my wife, with my friends, with my, with my children. So you, the reality is proof of faith is just, it's everywhere. You just have to allow for it and look for it. So as you leave today, I challenge you to try and eliminate the noise. Slow down. Try to inventory your blessings, not just everything going negative. And try to move your emphasis. So much of our emphasis is up here. Move your emphasis down here. Let this drive the bus. And just know that no matter what the situation, we never walk alone, and that faith in God's grace will always prevail. And most important, pray. Pray for understanding. Pray to give thanks. You know, pray for each other. And maybe, you know what, pray for me. Pray for me to someday just jump into the pool. God bless and thanks.